Ethan, welcome to the Ball Just Play podcast. So, um, <laughs> I can't. I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce your your last name. Kobayashi, and uh, it's just Ethan Sia now. Yeah. yeah, Ethan Sia. Okay, Ethan Sia. Um, very, uh, very good to have you. So, you and I had a really amazing conversation last week. I was kind of uh, regretted that we didn't record it. We didn't need to record the first time because I I've been meaning to kind of dig into your work uh, for a while. Um, you are actually I didn't even know you're uh, now on the board of the Ravicki Foundation, um, but I know that you like me are kind of exploring the space between uh, John Ravicki's wisdom model and cognitive science and physical mm -hmm. practices. Yeah. I've seen you do that a couple of times on, on Vivekis podcast, and I wanted to dig in a little bit deeper. Um, but mm. then when we started talking, it was like, okay, it was quite easy to to get very deep. We got really deep right away about um, what was the first question you asked me? I'm trying to remember. It was quite... What embodiment is. Yeah, what embodiment is. There you go. Well, I, I spoke with Nathan Vanderpool last week as well. So lots of, lots of questions are around what embodiment <laughs> is. Um but let's start with with your background. I I um I knew that you were working in kind of an intersection between movement, you know, some stuff that looks mm. like movement culture, um, and and uh, and John's work. Uh, as I mentioned, you're on the Verveki Foundation, and uh, you told me last time that you had done about three years of parkour training. Somehow, yeah. I hadn't caught that your your kind of primary point is actually sort of around theater. At least that's what uh, what yeah, the website says. So your website's five to midnight. Uh, yeah, five to midnight dot org. Yeah, and you teach a series of events called Tiamat and do a few other different kind of work with people. So tell me how um, how you ended up in theater and hmm. the relationship between theater, movement culture, parkour, and John Verveke because that's quite a odd uh, bundle. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, okay, a couple of clarifications uh, just off the bat, like, at first, well, first of all, uh, I'm not on the board of the Vicky Foundation, I'm actually uh, staff, so I'm the Director of Community Development and Partnerships um, at the Vicky Foundation at present, um, and so I suppose this is this is kind of a story which I've sort of gone into like on um, Greg Enriquez's podcast, uh, you talking with Greg. Mm -hmm. um, and so the short version of it is that actually uh, kind of the root of uh, Tiamat as an ecology of practices uh, that leverages performance mm -hmm. um, and for e coxi, which is sort of where John comes in, um, is at first started out as an actor training method. Um, and this was because I had spent many years as an actor um, from when I was like 12 or 15, something like that. You know, I was, I was already from quite a young age starting to do professional work, like I was getting paid for it. And then I had professional training in my 20s um, in London. I, I was fortunate enough to go to London Drama School. And it was in that time that I was like, oh, okay there's something here that's missing. Like we're learning a lot of techniques, um, but then when it came to making that transition about creating your own sort of process for being a performer, we weren't told how to integrate that. Mm. And I was like, okay, can we actually develop a way of like, by researching sort of the lowest common denominator of what makes performance actually get better at integrating. So it's almost that, that Vivekian piece of like evolving evolvability is like, how do we get better at the, the mechanics of integration? Yeah. Um, and so that began actually quite an introspective sort of uh, train of research, where it's like, it's almost ethnographic, autoethnographic. It's like, okay, what's actually happening to me when I'm in performance, when I'm creating something, when I'm out in daily life, does it transfer? And I had no vocabulary for that. Um, for all of the years that I had been dabbling in different forms of, I suppose, like public representation, uh, whether it was in street magic or whether I was practicing parkour, whether I was doing martial arts, um, you know, that 
that piece of like, what's actually happening here in my experience? And can I talk about it? And what's the word um, for this thing that's happening? That's where John came in. So the trajectory of it in sort of like a bullet point format is started out as an actor, got into actor training, did my own research and experimentation, um, started my own company, which is five to midnight, trying to do more of that research. And then while I was doing my master's, got introduced to John Pavecki's work. And now I have the vocabulary to speak about it. Um, and then that's where it's taken a turn much more developmentally um, and trying to be more general rather than being located specifically to performers. Mm -hmm. And so to tie, to sort of like tie that introspective uh, train of thought all the way down to the root is, you know, and this was kind of something that came to me only about the past six months or so, which is like, why am I making this thing? Why am I researching this so hard? And, you know, for me, it really comes from this place of like, I'm trying to find out how I play a game so that I can teach that game to other people and maybe find people that can play with me. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's uh, that's perfect. That's exactly, in some sense, my motivation uh, when I started evolving with play was sort of like, I like the game of parkour a lot, but mm -hmm. it was sort of incomplete for me because I had a background in martial arts and I felt that there was some intersection between the martial arts and parkour that was important for the goal that parkour seemed to be aimed at this goal of um being strong to be useful or to to be and to last um yeah and then you know or to be able to reach and escape an emergency situation you know theoretically mm -hmm. we're training for that it's like well maybe maybe you need to fight your way out um you know you're not a, you're not very complete as somebody who can uh and reach an escape if you can't also uh, fight, right? In a in a fundamental, mm. context. Um, you know, if you're going to train, say, military personnel, ingress and egress, right? Well, they got to be able to do something once they're in there or on their mm -hmm. way. Uh, and so that, that there was always an interesting intersection for me in those two arts. And then at the same time, I also was in love with the natural world and wanting to be in the natural world. Hmm. And parkour was very urban coded at the time. Um, and so it was like, well, I just want people to come and play with me in the woods where we can do parkour and do some martial hmm. arts. And then eventually as I explored things more dance and like lift things and carry them and throw them and do the, do all the human stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I've just been trying to create playmates really. <laughs> But as 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 that has evolved, in some sense, it's gone from being like a series of local games to like, well, um, how do we scale up from these local games to this meta game of life? Um, mm. So yeah, just an interesting the the way to describe that. And um, my second question here that I had for you is like, what is happening with the movement community? Right, it's quite a, quite a strange thing in some sense that mm. you and I are meeting through our mutual connection with John, Verve uh, John Verveke, right? Yeah. Um, you have dabbled in parkour. You've spent time with kind of um, the Ida Portal style of movement culture, uh, various other arts. And yet the, the connection point is the meaning crisis. Mm. And there's a way in which it seems like um, there is this emergent, sensitivity to the idea of wisdom or the idea of the sacred that's that is bubbling up in the movement community and mm. you know you can see it in in both of us but why why no. why is that happening in the movement community Ethan? that's such a fascinating question i i mean i get the sense that the thing you're pointing at in terms of the what is happening in the movement culture now is something like, what is this emergent interest mm -hmm. is what I'm hearing in that. Um, not just not just interest in movement, but there is something larger around the movement or the or at least the idea or the experience of movement, which is somehow nested in this larger kind of like, I suppose maybe it's a cultural shift mm -hmm. um, 
or a ph or phenomenon that's happening. So, um, yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. I think that um, this is, <laughs> I was just thinking about this just now before I hopped onto the call, like we had talked at length in our last conversation about like how important it is for for in order to be a cognitive agent, one has to also be in action. One has to be acting in the world. And I know that's such a core fundamental part of your practice. Um, and I was reflecting on that a little bit and going like, wow, okay. Something's happened to me uh, in my experience where like, since I got into sort of the Vivekian terminology, I started to en engage a little bit more with theory that, Folks start to recognize me a little bit less as a practitioner and more of a theorist when I recognize myself fundamentally more as a practitioner uh, than a theorist. So I'm, I'm actually quite grateful to have a conversation with a fellow practitioner that also has an eye on the theory. Now, does it relate to the meaning crisis? Uh, absolutely. For me, I, I'm, I'm on the fence about that, you know, Rafe. Like, I think it's something or at least I try and take a more phenomenological uh, uh, angle on it, which is that I feel like we're, we're in a time where the mental behavior and the physical behavior are so separated that when practitioners like you and I try and you know do the work and, and bring these things together into the body mind and integrate these two things, it's almost that same question of like, what's this? What's the mechanic here? What's in between? How do I resolve the coherence between this split, which was previously so familiar and now needs to be sense made? Mm -hmm. And so I almost wonder if it's like for somebody who's coming into a workshop, you know, of mine or yours, if the focus is necessarily on the meaning crisis or if it's actually the enaction of a kind of inquiry, a self-inquiry into how do these things that were previously so separate in my experience actually dovetail together. And I have a certain kind of like enthusiasm for, you know, helping people sort of find that, that, that connective tissue. Um, and it might scale out into the meaning crisis, but I think that's far beyond our, our immediate uh, individual kind of influence. At least that's what I think. I think it's a, I think it's a self-inquiry piece. How's that land with you, man? Um, yeah, it brings up, there's some interesting thoughts that come up for me. I, I do actually, I would I would stake the claim that that movement practice is actually at the center of the solution to the, the meaning crisis. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's something that's taken me quite a long time of of interacting with John's work and theorizing to 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 be able to settle in and say, no, it's it's not, you know, Whenever you have the experience of a transformative practice, it's very easy to kind of develop a myopic narcissism about the the thing that you're yeah. doing, right? And 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 you always stand within where you where you've been, right? So, I was talking uh, about John. Like I think John deeply understands embodiment, and he appreciates intensely what you do and what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and that I feel like there's a way in which John habitually, even though he like he talks about us, you know, he talks about me a lot, which is really wonderful. But I also see that John sort of habitually falls into the dialogical as the, the center point of his model of how, how the meaning crisis is solved. Um, mm. And I think that there's a way in which, even though he has a really coherent holistic model, it's almost hard for him to stand somewhere else because he's, you know, he's in his 60s, and he's spent so much of his life in this space. It's like, he can't exactly come and be where I am. Hmm. Because he can't, he can't have, he can't go and be 23. And do part hmm. for 18 years. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And, and of course, you know, I hope this is, uh, um, lands is like a, as a fair and, 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 and gracious critique, because I think that what's extraordinary about John is that he, he's so gracious and he can see outside of his, uh, his little vision. Right. Um, mm -hmm. so well, and he's so oriented towards helping other voices that are 
helping to 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 do this this come out. But it was just an interesting thing of like, I feel like it's here, and I see him mostly operating here, even though he, mm -hmm. he recognizes and hears my arguments when I make make the argument that it's here. But it's like, well, he 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 has to argue from that place because it's where he he has been. It's what it's his developmental pathway in a way is the way that it feels. And then it's the same for me. Yeah. Right? The reason I bring that up is it's like. I'm going to prioritize parkour in some sense. And I can I can exercise metacognition. I can look at other people's. I can sort of ethnographize the world. And I can say, ah, here's how I think it's part of the answer. And here's why it's not the only answer or the answer for everybody. Mm. There's a certain way in which I'm always going to stand within it because it's shaped me so much. So to be, to be fair, I just want to put that on the table. But the there's a there's a way in which ultimately ultimately the, the the kind of answer to the meaning crisis has to be in the capacity for adaptive action in the world yes and we have to have the embodied capacity to express virtue we have to be able to enter modes of being that ground out an actual motor action in order mm -hmm. to be adaptive to the problems that we face. Mm -hmm. uh, and our, um, you, you said that all of our wisdom practice in, in your interview with, with, in one of your interviews with John, you said our traditional wisdom practices are problematic because they are all to some degree disembodied, decontextualized, and objectified. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, I think, what, what we need to solve and why movement is central to it. I think as, as you were sort of giving your answer that my mind was going down this track of um, there's almost a way in which what's emerging in the movement community is also kind of downstream of what's happening or it's very related to what's happening within science because I think that yeah. and philosophy for that matter, we're all grappling with the problem of complexity. Yeah. Right. We, we we used to be able to look at the body. You know, 40 years ago, you could look at the body and most of our models of the body were the body as a machine. And they were sufficient that we felt like we were making progress, right? If you mm -hmm. want to mm -hmm. help people grow bigger muscles, if you want people to have better cardiorespiratory function, you can really treat them body in a machine-like way. But we kept running into these problems that didn't seem to respond to the treatment of machine. Can we make athletes... How well, if you make an athlete have bigger muscles and um, better cardiorespiratory function, how much does it impact their performance? Mm -hmm. it turns out that it's not that it's not it's not the whole thing. A lot. It's is not that one and zero. Yeah, it's a lot is left on the table. You know, you're you. No amount of cardio is going to help Shaq, uh, Shaquille O'Neal hit free throws. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm, so you're mm -hmm. you're like now you're having to deal with this messy wooey part of the human being like what what is the what is the the psychological context that drives the barrier to him hitting those free throws pain is another point where we're like all of our mechanical models of pain failed and we had to deal with the psychosocial model of pain right biopsychosocial mm -hmm. and and it's sort of just once you adopt the the idea of the biopsychosocial model of performance and pain, you kind of end up in a place that that starts to muck around with meaning. You can't avoid it at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think, mm -hmm. in some sense, as we're you know, as an athlete, you're trying to solve your own problems. As a practitioner, you're trying to solve your own problems, and you go and you find the latest. You know, maybe you go to a little bit of research on pain science and these frames sort of colonize out to the space that we're working in. And then they, they, they destabilize the frames that we were working within. Mm. And then, then these questions, I think, maybe emerge. And so that's one, one way I think about it. I also think that there's a, there's an interesting way in which, um, different movement cultures have kind of operated as like cults, right? Mm -hmm, like there's, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a hunger in our culture for meaning and 
and then people have found surfing and they found skateboarding and they found snowboarding and they found rock climbing they found yoga and all of this mm. is happening while people were dabbling with punk and of course punk super tightly coupled to skateboarding mm -hmm. right? new mm -hmm. age spirituality is super tightly coupled to yoga mm -hmm. right um and that's been sort of coming and going for years and generations of young people have said well, like th this is it this is meaning for me is in this in this physical practice and i think that over and over again what what, what happens is you you just reach a certain point in your life where it doesn't actually function anymore and and uh and then then it invites these broader questions and and w as we enter those broader questions it it sort of hits the broader milieu of what's happening philosophically. I saw Ido Portal uh, post mm. about we need philosophy. And I thought that was such a funny thing because I had been talking to you and I've been talking to, to Nathan <laughs> Vanderpool and and all of these people. One of the sorry, I've talked a lot. I'll I'll, I'll hand it Please go. Go on, go on. Yeah. I guess I've been generating a lot of thoughts about this. But the last little piece that I want to talk about is this idea that I think it was young who said that young people kind of have a messianic stage, right? So you catalyze an identity when you're young. Mm -hmm. It's independent of the identity of your, of your, of your parents or the culture that passed down to you in some sense. So you're a punk and a skateboarder or you're, you know, you're a follower of some guru and you practice yoga. And then for, for the parkour community, it was parkour, right? And parkour was the mm -hmm. thing was was really profound we could feel that it transformed us and it was really really meaningful i think particularly for young men right? mm -hmm. when they're yeah. 14 15 16 17 up into their early 20s there's a way in which it catalyzes a change that that i think young men in particular have an inherent aspiration towards which is the transformation of the self into something courageous right? something physically vigorous and powerful Mm. And then you think that that's you, you, you collapse everything into that. This is it. This is the thing. But then you reach your thirties and it's not made you a better partner or husband or father or all these other things that you're maybe dealing with as challenges in your life. And the meaningfulness of it can collapse in a way. And a lot of mm. people lose their practice around that time because mm work comes in family comes in all of these other things come in and and it and the the feeling that you had in your late teens or 20s that this thing was the most transformative powerful like your whole identity could be invested in it, it just feels naive looking back on it hmm. and so i think there's a cycle of people going through this these messianic stages i think the movement culture was exactly the same right um hmm. And then you, there's a point at which it has to become, it has to evolve into the type of thing that can serve someone in their 30s and 40s, hmm. it can serve a community. And I think that 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 there's a way in which the the scientific milieu, the philosophical philosophical milieu, they are providing i think actually a better answer for us as we hit that stage but in some sense we yeah. have like a better answer available to us and a worse answer because the other thing that i see happening within parkour is it's collapsed into uh, a lot of the young people within it have become very um it's become very bound with wokeness right in the same way that like new atheism sort of collapsed into uh into social justice i see the same tendency in parkour it went from a place where Everybody was there because they practiced parkour and that could bridge the gaps between pol uh, political differences to now you have an expectation of a politics that's associated with the practice. People who don't agree with it are starting to self-censor. Mm. Mm. Um, and so that we have a kind of even more collapsed, more parasitical version of, of, a, of, a, of a meaning structure. And then we have like for Vakey and Peterson and various other people who are pointing us to a, a more open one. So, sorry, that was just way too many thoughts. So, um, 
I guess I'm well, just there's gonna, a lot I'm there. Gonna, I'm going to mm. offer my first question to you back, having yeah. heard my response to it. What yeah. is happening with the movement community? Let's ask it again. Good. I, and I love that move. I love the move to kind of like go around the thing and like clarify what's actually happening around the question before we circumvent on the question again. Yeah. You know, um, and you've demonstrated in doing that, there's a lot there, don't get me wrong. And I'm, I'm trying to track it even now. But I want to highlight that that is the act of philosophy. Mm-hmm. And this was, um, Iris Murdoch had said, this is one of like the first things that um, she puts in, in, in that book, The Sovereignty of the Good, where philosophy, I'm going to butcher the quote, but philosophy is, a, is coming back around to where you had started having made the journey. And that's the point. So I really, really appreciate all of that. Now, um, there are some points which I want to kind of like uh, double click on a little bit. So you've offered what I'm seeing as like quite a large umbrella assessment of what's happening in the movement culture um, in the way that you've tracked it historically through your own experience as a, as a parkour practitioner, right? Um, and a martial artist. And also like as you as you are also influenced by the philosophy and, and Viveki's work and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's all part of this umbrella, which we can point at and name as the meaning crisis. And I want to just offer almost like it's, uh, it's not a complete opposite, but it's like an orthogonal sort of relationship, which is to what extent um, does one's agency factor into that? And how does one become a practitioner? So it's, it's surrounding me partially in like a VF sort of context, but also just personally as a facilitator. Yeah, um, foundation. yeah. it's like it's, it's circumventing around this question of like, does somebody need to be able to conceptualize and know the meaning crisis in order to motivate oneself to be part of the solution? Mm. So, and I, and I say that with a kind of intention for accessibility. So, uh, John has a wonderful series, it's 50 hours long, but I don't expect anyone who comes into my workshop to have watched that. And in fact, I've been in situations um, and had people in those rooms that I hold who have gone through that. And it's immensely difficult for them to overcome that and get into the practice and move into the practice. Because there is a way in which the awareness of the concept of the meaning crisis, not the meaning crisis itself, but the, but the concept of it has its own gravity and has its own weight. So it tends to lead into like a rumination or like over indexing on the theoretical thing. And it makes shares that are supposed to be five minutes long, you know, go on for like 15 minutes as we try and like break down what the theory of the exercise that we're doing is. And it's like, I can, I can talk about that 15 minutes, but we're still not doing it, you know? So, for me is that question is that question of like how do we motivate people into the practice so i'm of the school of thought that one doesn't need to and i hope shouldn't need to watch awakening from the meaning crisis to be motivated to move that's one piece of it um and i think that there's benefits to that then um there's sort of another piece that sort of like uh starts to come up for me and i'm sort of like reaching for it in a certain way, because it's a bit amorphous for me. And uh, part of it is this sort of like philosophical dimension, um, which rightly ties into meaning. So when you are articulating, uh, so this like uh, new age is tied into yoga and, you know, parkour has its own sort of like uh, punk and skateboarding and parkour has its own sort of political dimension. I'm seeing in what you're describing the emergence of subcultures. Mm -hmm. Why do subcultures form? Why do we gather around some kind of practice, some kind of ideology, a particular philosophy, for example? And it should, I hope, (laughs) be because it's meaningful. There is something about um, punk that's very, that finds skateboarding very meaningful and vice versa. Mm You know, the same thing happens across these subcultures. And a part of me feels there's a there's a sense of belonging, like a belonging need that yeah. needs to be fulfilled in that space. We don't want to be alone um, because we are social animals. 
And it almost comes back around to where we started this conversation of like why we each have our ecology of practices. We're trying to find playmates. And I don't think that's separate from any of these three examples. Skateboarders are finding playmates and other skateboarders yeah, yeah, at the skate sure. park. Yeah, it's a way of, <laughs> of, of creating relationships that feel really meaningful. Um, yes. I think about this a lot. Like uh, one aspect of the meaning crisis is, is the loneliness crisis. Yes. People yes. are, um, I think something like 15% of, of Americans now don't report having any close friends. Mm -hmm. the kind of, I think it's the, 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 the median number of close friends or the average number of close friends, I can't remember, is one. Um, mm -hmm. And just 20 years ago, it was three. These are, you know, take these numbers with a grain of salt. They're approximately in the right direction, but um, not precise. But it's, it's, we're seeing a rapid decline in people's, uh, the depth and intimacy of people's social networks. And um, the, the, there's a, there's a statistics I read once that it takes about 500 hours to form a deeply intimate friendship. Mm. And we have a problem, which is that kind of with a, I think capitalism um, is, is not good for social life. Now, hmm. say more about this that. Is not, this is not a, um, this is not a critique of market capitalism in general, because I think it does a lot of things that we really need it to do. Um, mm -hmm. but there's a kind of way in which we have collapsed our kind of institutional structure towards capitalism that ends up um, allowing this sort of game theory problem to develop. And the game theory problem is basically this. Uh, human beings are assets are are assets that create capital within a mm -hmm. fundamental capital system and you the production of capital is maximized when the individual units are as fungible as possible or at least that appears to be the case uh in the short term in the long term it actually probably breaks because we're relying on social capital and stuff to make these institutions work. But in the short run, if you can, if you can, you know, take a family of two people and break them up and move them into two different cities, you actually produce more GDP. Mm -hmm. And there's two reasons for that. One is, well, two mortgages, but the other is that capitalism thrives off of comparative advantage. So comparative advantage is basically you want to do the thing that you are most leveraged to do compared yeah. to any other thing that you do and you want to spend as much of your time doing that as possible if you want to maximize the production of capital so the likelihood that any two people three people four people five people six people eight people nine people ten people etc all have their greatest comparative advantage in a single place you know decreases with every member of that network that you create yeah so you know I might have my best professional sort of opportunities if I move to London and my wife might have her best professional opportunities if she moved to San Francisco. Right. And that mm -hmm. obviously is destabilizing to relationship. Um, but you can, you can then look at that in friendship groups, right? If you, mm. you know, if you had a really tight group of friends, uh, you know, in college, like, how likely is it that you all actually end up in the same city or in the same region of the same city? Like I had friends who lived in Seattle who were far enough away from me that it was functionally like they, you know, it was just impossible to get to the other side of the city. So mm -hmm. you, you're, you're kind of churning through relationships just by the nature of our, of our economic system. And that's a huge problem for people. So subcultures can create, uh, they can create a, a rapid entry towards a type of intimacy. This is something that we've seen through our workshops. So I said 500 mm. hours to create a truly intimate friendship. Really meaningful experiences, really intense experiences, catalyze experiences of friendship much faster. So um, if you and I show up for work at the same office doing you know, IT work, 
for 10 years, we might have zero intimate moments with each other, like real moments. We might have spent 500 hours together, but they're just basically meaningless. Mm -hmm. But if you come to Tiamat or you come to Return to the Source and you have an intense dialogue and you do some intense physical practice and you are in a beautiful natural space and you jump over a waterfall, it's like you remember those moments with that person. That person has now entered into your psyche on a deeper level. And so the experience of intimacy is much higher. And so we can catalyze the potential for friendship much faster through that. And it's the same sense like you, if you, if you go skateboard with a buddy, like you, that's a fundamentally more intimate form of engagement, right? You're pushing your edges, you're entering flow states, you're taking on danger together. You're doing something that's taboo socially that might get you in trouble, that creates a little bit of anxiety around it, that you have to work through together, that creates a bond. Like all of those things act really powerfully to, um, yeah, to create intimacy. Um, hmm. Yeah, I feel kind of playful around this. Like I kind of want to poke holes in that a little sure. bit okay. because I think that, and it, but you know, it's 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 because I think that the the thing that you're pointing at is not necessarily capitalism, but is about the grammar of which capitalism creates. Like we're products of capitalism, we're products of a of a capitalist society. So there's a certain way in which, like, relationally, or and I mean that to others, but also I mean that to the self and in relation to the world, um, we can't really help but think of it in in a capitalist grammar. Right? So. I would argue that there is a, there is an intervention point, I think, mm -hmm. and it is somewhat more independent of whatever the activity is. I would argue that it's actually much more about intervening directly on the grammar itself. How, ah, okay, I'll be very careful about this because I, I think this is like, I love it because at the edge of my thought. But I think we can, through movement, remind people how to deepen relationships, how to accelerate the depth of that relationship. It's still around the ballpark of 500 hours, but in, in the same way that there is an internal sort of like um, uh, stuckness that's generated by the cognitive grammar of capitalism, there's also like an external push factor of like, oh, this is a this is a stranger here, and I don't know how to interact with that in this new office, <laughs> you know. But what if, and this really is an if, what if uh, one could go to a new job, and it's a corporate job, the regular nine to five job, and find or or place themselves in a stance in a position where meaning itself can be made even in that context you know? so I, I like to emphasize that like as human beings we are meaning making creatures not meaning finding creatures meaning finding implies that the meaning is out there divorced from us and you know it relies on us sort of like scrounging through the mud in order for the meaning to be found whether it be you know at a skate park or in a rave or or in something like that but I would say that it is through the engagement and with the awareness consciously, intentionally to make meaning of that relationship. Ooh, that's where I think the human aspect really shines to the fore. And there is something for me that's almost uh, romantic without being decadent. I hope mm -hmm. that, you know, on the, on the street, one could, one could um, engage in, a very meaningful conversation there and then and have it no less significant than a spiritual experience, um, which is sort of like this idea of the divinity within the mundane. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to uh, one of my uh, um, uh, collaborators from Prague and, and they run the Brain We Are podcast. And he, they, we had just done Tiamat Tier 1 and he was articulating this experiment that he had done when he was in uh, undergrad. He walked down the street and spontaneously try and high-five strangers on the street. Mm -hmm. And some of them would 
make that high five and some of them wouldn't and he would sit with the joy of having somebody high five and you know maybe have a small interaction and sit with the rejection as well and go well how is this significant to me actually this small passing gesture yeah you know from someone i might never meet again what is the significance of that without falling into a narcissistic uh, uh spiral it's like oh there's something in that and when we tie that into the larger picture, because you have brought this up uh, about the loneliness piece, is that have we just forgotten how to make connections such that we address the loneliness? Is that the yeah. thing? I mean, hmm. so you, you brought up an interesting idea, which is like, what if you started uh, a new office job and there was kind of an assumption and a grammar around how to create meaningful relationships within that sphere. Is that the right way to describe what you were, you were kind of pointing at? Does one have the, I think it's the availability of skill, like the availability. Uh, yeah. So there's a, it's, I'm not saying do it instrumentally. Yeah, yeah. No, but no, that's, like, yeah. well, that's, yeah. a, that's an interesting and important distinction. Do you have yes. the skills, but where would you go for the skills? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I'm somewhat biased as I as I give this answer, but that's part of why I fell in love with the authentic relating sort of sphere, the authentic relating circling kind of sphere, and why um, the the sort of dialogical component of John's work is uh, important mm -hmm. in the ecology of practice. Why it's been weaved in because there is there are certain muscles that we can isolate. This is Taylor Barrett's example. Like you go yeah. to the gym, there are certain isolating muscles that. You know, even though I would never do this movement, you know, out in life, but it helps make it stronger such that I have a constitution upon which, you know, if something were to require, you know, the entire chain, right, in my shoulder is not going to crack, it's not going to pop, and I'm not going to have to worry about never using it again, you know. Um, so there's that aspect. And I saw this exemplified actually in John. Um, I like, I don't think I've ever actually told this story before. So, you know, this is sort of coming off the back of what you had said earlier, where the dialogical component is quite large in him. I would agree with that, but I would also say that it is, it is in the times when he's not on a podcast, when he's not constrained to the medium in the way that we are, mm -hmm. that everything else that is not dialogical comes to the fore. We were outside our uh, apartment in London. We were, on, we were giving some, um, well, he was giving talks. I was chaperoning him in a way. And we were waiting for a cab to take us somewhere else. Um, and I had all my bags and I brought, uh, I usually bring uh, I'd like, like a dragon star for like a trio of juggling sticks with me whenever I travel. And he sort of looked over at the sticks and he was like, oh, can I borrow one of those? Mm -hmm. And it's like, I was like, yeah, by all means, because I was fiddling with one. I'm like, yeah, take one. And he took it and like, I saw, I watched him as he like checked the weight and then he launched into like a Tai Chi sword form oh, on yeah. the side of the street while we're waiting for the cab. Yeah, it's, like, it's true. He has that availability. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a frustration that I have with the sense making space, right? So, uh, you know, Rebel Wisdom, Daniel Schmachtenberger, uh, John, Greg Enriquez, all these these people is, it feels like so much there's a pointing to something that mm. is difficult to see exemplified in uh, their, their, uh, their public, right? So what you're saying mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, my favorite, my favorite experience with John was um, we do uh, at Return of the Source, it came to Return of the Source in 2021, 2022, 20, 2022, 20, 20, 20, 20, I think. Uh, anyways, uh, 2022. Yeah, he came to Return of the Source in 2022. And we, so I, I became a, I, 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 years ago, I noticed that when I told a story, it was more powerful than giving people a series of propositional facts in helping them understand what we're doing through our, our retreats. So I became very interested in story. I found Jordan Peterson's work and I went really deep into his maps of meaning around that. And so I started sharing the archetypal stories that came out of that. So sharing the story of St. George and the Dragon Slayer, for instance, at the retreats and then helping people connect that that story 
is actually a symbol of the fundamental process that the practice is engaged in with, right? Um, but through John's work and then also through my own observation and particularly the kind of a constraints letter ecological dynamics approach to motor learning, there was this realization that giving people a story is powerful, but helping mm -hmm. them generate and comprehend their own story is maybe more powerful. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have a storytelling component at our retreats but we also have a bottom-up storytelling component. So on the last night that we spend on the property, we ask the participants to share a, to share the story of their experience. So they have, they're each, there's four clans that are kind of working together throughout the week. And then they each get up and give a performance that is about the story. And we tell them, tell it as if it's an epic myth, remembered a thousand years later, right? But you can tell it in any format that you want. So we've had interpretive dance, we've had haiku poetry, we've had, you know, um, I love this stand up comedy, yeah. you know, any number of things. So John and the group that John was with, they created this skit where uh, their clan was the Badger Moles, you know, from Avatar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, the Earthbenders, the, Ava, the, the Badger Moles, they their dimension was having a meaning crisis mm. and the badger moles were losing their optimal grip. Um, and so they had to go get John and then John had to come and help me and Kyle and Aaron, like from our dimensions, then come and save the, the badger moles. Mm -hmm. And uh, John, <laughs> John was just hilarious as, the, as himself. He played John Verveke, right? <laughs> yeah. Like when the, I think when they found me, I was like typing at a computer, just saying like blah 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 blah, like big word, big word, big word, Jordan Peterson, big word, big word, big word, Jordan Peterson. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're like, oh no, he's 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 collapsed into uh to you know uh, the the Jordan Peterson thing, and John was like, you know, oh everywhere I go, I always gotta deal with this. <laughs> You know, they, there was so much of like John's language that was, um, you know, like the optimal grip thing that was that yeah. was crafted into this story in a way that made fun of it, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and so to see John sort of play out the parody, the caricature of himself and using his words to, to, to basically poke fun at, at him uh, was so beautiful. And, and so you see that and I was like, I really, David Fuller from Rebel Wisdom was there and he felt like they'd had enough filming. So they didn't film that. I was like, that's the best thing. Mm, best part. Yeah. It was the best part. We needed that. People needed to see that, acting that mm. out because, because it exemplifies the transformations that we're trying to achieve in people through these propositions that we're making in this space where we, we're limited in our ability to, to play with dimensions other than mm. the propositional. Mm, mm, so mm, I have a mm. frustration, like I get to play a kind of role that has the, the propositional um, dialogical component. And then I get to go show the other side of the practice, right? Because people will pay attention to, my physical practice because it's spectacular right yeah um you know it, if john was to start a an instagram channel of him practicing tai chi forms it probably wouldn't have that kind of impact right i mean maybe he should yeah that's, that's a pretty fucking good idea <laughs> okay there we go so yeah you know so just, just to yeah to, but but that's, yeah, that's, that's what I'm pointing at is this idea of like all the parts of the practice that can't be done on a Zoom call are in some sense, the elephants of the room of the whole community, <laughs> because we keep pointing, yeah. talking about how important they are. And yet we end up doing this, what we're doing right now 
as the primary way that it's accessible to the public um, because it's the most easy to make accessible to the public. But it creates a, a perception problem, right? It creates a, a yeah. It, you know, as you said, like students who've absorbed all of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, there's a propositional weight that they're carrying that can actually get in the way of them accessing the very things that will help them begin to try to solve the meaning crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In fact, I would argue like a part of me is still, is still here, but like, and, and I'm almost kind of like, now it's very, now I was very on fire. It's like, I want us almost to have this conversation while we were going down that nature path that you took okay. me on in the last call. And we're just sort of like talking in person, occasionally punctuated by us hopping a fence or jumping off a waterfall and then come back and talk about Confucius. Yeah, yeah. You know, like there's something live about that. And I even should, as uh, a facilitator. Yeah, hmm? actually, we should, you can come out here and we'll, we'll film a podcast. We'll get someone to carry the camera and, and follow us around. And then I'll recruit my friends to jump off the waterfall. Yep. On our yep, yep. I'm going I'm to hold you to that, Rafe. I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> because gotta, no, because gotta, it's, it's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, because I think it's, I think you're, you're really, really on the money here where it's like, well, you know, as even as a facilitator, I'm like, I can't, I can't do a tier met tier one online. And a lot of me doesn't want to, because it's so dependent on the embodied relational dynamic, yeah. you know, it requires you to bump up against somebody and like push them and, you know, like feel somebody's weight on you with you pulling away from you, you know, this, the smell in the room. Um, that's a fundamental component. And there's almost a kind of uh, complacency around how easy it is to Zoom something or YouTube something or TikTok something. And then you TikTok it until you're just like talking and you're not actually ticking mm -hmm. at all, <laughs> right? And there's something in here about like, what is it going to take to move somebody from the screen and in, in front of the tree and in, in front of somebody else? It doesn't even have to be that far out you know i don't have to go all the way to washington state maybe you know it's like but even just with somebody downstairs when i'm walking down the street with a high five it could work now having said that though it's like i also recognize the conveniences of which this affords i mean uh, if it was next if we we're recording this next week then we'd be halfway around the world but i'm across the border from you yeah. and this conversation would not have been as possible just insofar as 20 years ago, right? And so there's almost like a wrestling. 10 years ago, yeah, there's almost like this wrestling between this amazing affordance that we have now and how it should actually also afford you and I like meeting and arm wrestling before dinner. Like there's something about that. It's like, how do we bridge that gap? And I think you've done that. Um, in this story that you shared about, about John, and I love that this piece is in Return to the Source because it is a proper theatrical element. Mm -hmm. you know, and we did something similar in Respond, um, but it, it, was not a parody, it was not a parody kind of tone and it wasn't necessarily in line with this biographical coherence um, piece. So we, this was during the Scholar meeting and I was in charge of designing the Scholar meeting um, for this year's Respond. Just for a yeah. second, do you mind... Uh letting people know what Respond is? Oh, yeah. Um, so Respond is uh, a project that attempts to gather together academics, practitioners, um, thinkers, philosophers, and really kind of create a cohesive, uh, how do I say this, something like a symposium um, that is geared towards addressing uh, the meta crisis and developing wisdom. And that's why, you know, that's how we both got to know Dr. Nathan Vanderpool, mm -hmm. um, who runs the Respond project. So um, I was on the Respond organizing team for this year's retreat. Um, and we have this, uh, uh, how do I say this, like the domain uh, of scholars, which is sort of like John Viveki's level of like experts in their field. Yeah. Um, and part of the design was to uh, leverage uh, a form of applied theater, which I'm trained in, this is forum theater, uh, where people can have, like we have a short skit uh, that has a particular scenario, and then we'll play that to the end one time, and then we'll play that again, but this time people can come in and, and intervene. They can take certain roles, create new roles, and they try and like, they're enacting the thing. 
So uh, what had happened was we had generated this uh, uh, situation or this scenario where um, one person was in a toxic relationship with somebody who had narcissistic suicidal tendencies mm -hmm. and was seeking counsel from two friends, one of whom was kind of like jaded and didn't want to be here anymore and you know had gone through this multiple times. Um, and then the other one who was like, there to be supportive, but implicitly romantically interested. And this is something we had found. And so we played this once, and then we asked the, the scholars to intervene and say, okay, you know, who wants to come in and take a role or try and, uh, um, you know, change the situation. And the folks who came in with this sort of like more heady approach, and mind you, we had therapists in the room, you know, won't come in with this heady approach. Um, weren't welcomed or it wasn't impacting you know it, it just wasn't changing the situation and uh john came in and took one of the roles he took the role of the person that was like kind of jaded and tired of it and i have i i, I feel it actually i kind of like um yeah i almost gotta like take a deep breath because it's kind of like um what's the word like very endearing for me to recall Mm -hmm. seeing John kind of go like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. I don't know what to do here. And another scholar, uh, Vivian Dittmar, uh, came and took the other part. And she did this amazing thing um, where in relationship with this, with this person who was in the toxic relationship, it's like, she says something along the lines of, um, yeah, there's this, there's this immature part of me that I wish could love in the way that you love to this depth, to this level, where you're so willing to put everything of yourself aside in service of this other person. And I can't do that. And I wish I could. And it's like, oh, there's something here. It's not the, it's not the healthy, intellectually, psychologically correct choice, but it's an acknowledgement of how much the other people cares and deeply and deeply empathetic. Mm. And what I saw happen was I saw John sort of like unlock something there where it's like, oh, I don't know what to do, but I know I can be here with you. Yeah. You know, and like, it's not about coming to a solution in that moment, but it was like watching how people be with each other in this particular situation. And then after this, then comes the sense making of like, okay, what is that? Um, yeah, then comes that situation of like, well, what's the next step? What's the, what's the sense making piece then? Mm. But yeah, coming back to the end of that story, I think like it's, there is a way to proportion the sense making, uh, faculties of it mm -hmm. in its right place to the right depth, which is why I, I don't, I don't criticize it until it is used in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, there is something about being able to discern like what is needed in the moment i will argue that's the wisdom move uh even though i did try to <laughs> go through this whole podcast without using the w word but yeah i think it's the right proportioning yeah mm. as you're sharing that story it reminded me of the point that john makes about uh exemplification of virtue versus argumentation right so very often in the platonic platonic dialogues there's not actually an a sort of like perfectly crafted proposition for what the virtue that's at stake is right socrates sort of doesn't do that but what he does is he showcases the virtue right so he he enters the mode of being associated with courage in his argument about courage or in his discussion mm. of courage. and by doing mm. so he gives a guide without having um a definitive sort of uh propositional structure yeah he models it models it um and i think there's a there's a lot of of wisdom in that you know if, if someone comes to you and says hey i'm having this problem in my romantic relationship right you can say hey well the research shows that if you guys are arguing this much that your relationship is going to fail you should you know do this x y and z or you should give up <laughs> you should give up or or you should you know exercise this solution right 
um, that can be less powerful than um, than recognizing an implicit aspect of this person is hurting and they need to me to show up in a space of love and to give them space mm. to process and to because what a person needs in in such a scenario isn't actually a perfect set of propositions around how to navigate a relationship because such a thing is actually not even yes. possible yes uh what they need is to have a kind of transformation in their salience and implicit uh landscape of how they navigate that relationship and that can be in some sense more powerfully transmitted through uh, the way that you act in relationship to that interaction than the mm -hmm. explicit content that is shared during the interaction that's a that's a fascinating idea to to um to play with well you know stories do that rafe mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's like, and this is sort of part of my thesis around why the why the theater is so powerful, yeah. is that we're watching something happen to somebody else, and that distance allows us to project ourselves into that particular scenario, and almost like indirectly model. Now, I think that there is, there is validity to that, there is plausibility to that, but there is also a way in which this can be done in the first person where let's say, you know, somebody does come to me and go, and this happens a lot in sort of my coaching practice where I, I coach, I, ho I coach clients one-to-one um, -one, and sometimes they'll come to me with this kind of issue mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, you know, I'm not talking to, I'm not really like feeling connected to my partner. I don't feel like we're, we're connecting. Let's call it that. We're not in dialogue. And what, I at least try and do is like, I say, okay, I'm just going to show up for you in a way that is different than that. Because what happens is here's this situation. Oh no, it's like, you know, and we're not connecting and like, they're not listening to me. They don't understand me. And what's possible in the realm of that relational dynamic is constrained and it's constrained into this are all the problems because it's constrained. Mm -hmm. And so, what happens is that being treated in a different way, being interacted with in a different way, and in it opens up the possibilities of what might be possible in this relationship. How other ways can I show up? Um, and that can become, if it's impactful enough, that can become transferable to like, oh, you know, you know, the way that Rafe talked to me was actually pretty amazing. I've never had a great conversation like that. I didn't know that would be possible mm -hmm. i didn't know that was available and it implicitly uh i've seen it happen a few times now implicitly transfers it's it's almost like i want to speak to the people i love in the way that someone has has lovingly engaged with me hmm. what are your thoughts on that i was just thinking about the the it, it reminds me of I think in some sense, the central problem is how to love well, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that Socrates claimed that, you know, his his great wisdom was to, you know, to to love wisely. Love wisely. Yeah. And, you know, in our last conversation, we we're talking about uh, Zen Platonic Confucianism versus... Zen Neoplatonic Confucianism, yeah, yes. Zen Neoplatonic Confucianism versus, I suppose, I'm more in a... Neoplaton, Taoist, Christian, <laughs> Christian play, <laughs> but I particularly, I I sort of see the, I have a taxonomy of, mm, let's call them approaches to the meaning crisis. Right, it mm. feels like there's these linked conversations that are distinctive but uh, related, and on one end you have. It's something like the reemergence of the narrative, right? And mm -hmm. Peterson, Jordan Peterson is a major player in this. He's saying, you know, new new atheism fails because it create because you you because you don't have a grounding for a for a system of values within. And Jonathan Pajot uh, is in some sense 
even further along that uh, trajectory, along that, um, not trajectory, but that spectrum of orientation mm. towards symbol and story. Um, and then I see John uh, as kind of sitting next to that in the realm of dialogue, dialogical practice and philo philosophy as, um, as practice, right? Like mm, mm, philosophy, mm. not as a discipline where we, you know, get academic uh, cred for writing and seeming intelligent and well-educated, but actually as some, as, as a thing that we proactively engage with because it, uh, because it affords us the potential for wisdom. Mm. So I, those two conversations seem linked to me. And then the next conversation over from that is what I would call the embodiment conversation. And is that where your stance is? Um, not quite. Um, okay. Uh, but the embodiment conversation would be the conversation of, to, to me, and we talked about this last time, embodiment is the, perhaps the best way to, to say it, my perception of it is embodiment is the recognition of the fundamental importance of the felt experience of being in a body or being a body. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then next to that is the, the active cultivation of virtue in the body, which is where parkour and martial arts lie. Yeah. That's the developmental sort yeah. of piece from that. Yeah. And all of those to me are necessary components of a kind of answer to the meaning crisis. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I always find myself in a kind of interestingly liminal space in these conversations, because if I, if I talk to a Jonathan Pajot or a Paul Vanderclay, I'm secular, right? Because I say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to commit to the idea that or at the moment, I'm not willing to commit to the idea that Christ died and was resurrected. That, that was a thing that happened in the same way that if I pick my phone up and drop it, that that is a thing that happens, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm not at all satisfied by the sort of historical arguments that, that we can treat that as an established fact. Mm. So in that sense, I'm I'm still sort of standing within a scientific epistemology as opposed to sort of stepping all the way over into a symbolic frame. But then when I talk to people within the kind of rational space and I talk about this underlying motivation or philosophical space, I end up sort of saying, I kind of think that Christianity is the best narrative frame because... I, I like Jonathan Pajot likes to say that that Christianity is a limit case storytelling wise that that mm. Christ is a kind of exemplar of the hero's journey and of the ultimate capacity of 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 the willingness to love in spite of injury mm. Mm. right mm. Mm to love when love is not deserved as mm. the most important redemptive capacity. So when I was um, really dialing into Jordan Peterson's ideas of the heroic archetype and the hero's journey, I was, I was sort of outlining how different practices engaged with different aspects of the hero. What is it to be to embody the heroic mm. archetype and how do different, um, different uh, mythological figures or historical figures kind of embody, act as exemplars for us or symbols for us. That. And I came up with this idea that, that fundamentally a hero needs vision, um, mm -hmm. articulation, emotional mm -hmm. strength, physical strength, and skillfulness. So five fundamental traits. And we can kind of use, uh, we used the figure of Horus as the, as the exemplar of, of, uh, of a vision right socrates is the exemplar of articulation mm. uh, the buddha is the exemplar of emotional containment and uh you know hercules or thor is the exemplar of physical capacity and then um the celtic god luke has the exemplar of of skillfulness 
right? And you mm -hmm. can switch them out, right? You could switch. Uh, Socrates works for emotional containment as well, and you know you could you could use Mercury for skillfulness instead of or Hermes, but it's 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 fun. It's a fun little thing. But what I re recognize when I when I did that is that um, you could actually cultivate and have immense capacity across all of those and turn them mm -hmm. to that they don't prevent you from being oriented towards evil that genghis khan you know is great at those things mm. um and so it's like well you have to serve something more than that and the ultimate thing that you could serve is uh truth and love and beauty right um the good the true the beautiful mm -hmm. and and that sort of love that motivates us towards those things so so i've been i've been thinking but when you when you get to that you kind of like you can end up sounding a little bit like a hippie right like a hippie is someone like all we need is love mm -hmm. and yet it failed right it was a I, I think the hippie movement you know obviously it 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 um it donated some really interesting things to the culture but ultimately it didn't it wasn't sustaining as a meaning system mm -hmm. and it didn't teach people morals and ethics and many of the people who adopted that most most intensely really failed on many dimensions of personal morality and ethics. Mm. So there's something about the way that we talk about love that is, that needs a deeper look, right? And I don't know, mm. I, I have almost forgotten the prompt now, but this is at the heart. The central of, question is how to love wisely. Yeah, how to love wisely. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I see Rafe, the way in which you wrestle with this with this question. It's like there's a there is I, I, I get the sense that there's an er, there's an eroticism about this question, not in a sexual sense, but there's a certain like pull into it. Um and rightly so because our last conversation, you know, we again, yeah, we should have recorded that because it it we got to a place where it was deeply personal for the both of us, uh, I'm understanding. And, and it positioned and reframed things in a certain way. Like, even as I recall it, I'm aware of this attitudinal shift that occurred during that conversation while I was making my dinner halfway through, yeah. you know? And like, because I'm because I'm aware of time and, and I'm so invested in this conversation, I, I want to just say, like, I would love to have another conversation with okay. you about this, that touches on exactly this like the spiritual element the sacred element and and what is our what is the the line i suppose the philosophical line that we can walk together that might take us there and so i'm going to put um to in 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 the interest of doing that i'll put a stone down on the ground for that um when i was young i was like 16 or something like that um i got deeply interested in christianity because I started going to church because my first girlfriend had uh, broken up my, my first breakup. Um, and I went to church as a result of that. You know, it pulled me there. And um, there was a way in which I read the Bible and formed like a naturalistic historical narrative for all of those things, right? Every single thing that occurred is like, okay, where do the dinosaurs go? And how does this fit into evolution? And da, 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 da. what did Jesus, where is Jesus actually going? If I track his nomadic, you know, path, where does it go? Um, and now looking back on that, I realized that by doing that, I had othered myself further from the, the value of the narrative, mm -hmm. the, the intrinsic value of that. So I want to bring in that, that piece where you said, you know, okay, I, I dropped my phone, you know, and, and it's a thing that happens. In theory, yes. As a thought experiment, yes, it is a thing that happens. But in life, in practice, it is not like that. It has to factor in much more complexity, um, you know, including, can I afford a new phone? Did I back up my, my photos to the cloud and have I lost them? Um, do I need them? do I need my phone imminently because I have to have a call and nothing else is charged and this was the only thing that I could do? You know, it's like there is a way in which the thought experiment hits that limit. And so now when I read the Bible, there is, and I think this is a, a move which I've heard uh, uh, Peugeot and Van der Klee are doing also, which is like, yeah, Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected three days later. Cool. 
you can talk about the historical narrative, but how is it important to you now here today as it stands right now, such that it transcends the thought experiment, transcends the narrative and becomes something that is embodied and can be enacted upon right here, right now. You know? And you can pull sort of like the other sages in to help, right? Like what is what is exemplified? I might not be able to understand emotional containment as the opponent processing between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system that affords emotional regulation within a stressful valent situation. But I can go, what does the Buddha do? Yeah, yeah. Or like, what is that? You know, uh, can yeah. I just regulate my breath? There's a Peterson, Peugeot, Vanderclay. They all, in some sense, avoid or like fundamentally, like Peterson says, we can't treat the biblical story as a scientific story, right? Mm. Peugeot doesn't just avoids justifying the Christian story, right? So, you know, Pedro says Genesis is true. It's like the most true thing phenomenologically because it describes the way that the world lays itself out consistently, right? But that doesn't mean that the Big Bang didn't happen. It doesn't mean that evolution didn't happen. Um, there's a pinch point though there you know like peterson talks about in his interview with peugeot there's a there's points at which the symbolic and the literal collapse to each other is the resurrection or the virgin birth one of those points or are these just stories right and um peugeot will tell you that he believes that they are true those are true right but he also will tell you that it's not a scientifically validatable statement you know, it's a, it's a, he says, I'm going mm -hmm. to stand on this ground. I'm going to have faith in this ground. Mm -hmm. That, that's something that I wrestle with, I guess, is, is, is how do we, you know, because so many people feel that like Peterson says, we have to stop doing that. That's what maps of meaning begins with, but he's still mm -hmm. doing it, right? Right. He's still asking the question in some sense that he begins Maps of Meaning with. In Maps of Meaning, he says, there's two modes of control of the world. There's the mode of the world as a forum for actions and the mode mm -hmm. of the world as a set of objective things. And myth tells us about the world as a forum for actions. And science tells us about the world of objective things. And when we are, have that conflict between them, it's because we we don't understand on some fundamental level the correct relationship between them. And, and that... And, but the interesting mm. thing is, you know, 25 years on from writing that book, Peterson still on some level seems to be trying to convince himself that he can talk about the resurrection of Christ as an objective scientific fact. <laughs> right? So I mean, maybe to, he's I not, but I see this move, I, right? Like or he's struggling so with nah. or what that stance is right um we who yeah. wrestle with god that's that's why he's wrestling with it but for me yes um here's <laughs> I, I i i'm i don't know it's there's a there's a way in which that doesn't seem like it actually matters that much to me and i think that's why i like john's non-theism move <laughs> yeah right because it's kind of like we don't we'll never know what happened in the levant two thousand years ago like like stop arguing about it right D does the story tell us the most important things that we need to know but you know um but, but you see Rick, i would i like would say I would, okay I'll, I'll put it to you i'll put it to you this way right that you are doing exactly that in the in the ritualization and the creation of the of the skit that you had articulated earlier yeah. you know, it's not a literary form yeah they're, and they're not i imagine that they're not reenacting every single beat no, no. right they're reenacting properly the the chunks of which the mythos is created yeah 
and it has to be placed into a form in which in this case is parody right of like blah 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 big word uh yes a big word big word big word John Pierce. and it's like you could you write that out and it makes no bloody sense but it's like there is an engagement with it that's live that's in person that has this this recognition of is not just somebody doing that it's john verveke doing that mm -hmm. it is the man himself taking a perspective on himself for other people right there is a there is almost in that sense a sacrificial element to it where it's like i can make fun of myself and this is sort of um out we have a mutual friend bradley um something that bradley and i've been talking about with clown right it's like clown is being able to take all of yourself and take a perspective on it from which you can manipulate that like an object for other in service of other people mm -hmm. you know and so I, I think that for me is the crux of it there is there is a limit again to the propositional to the being able to talk about it where it becomes a contradiction it has to change its own form um, and that's where i think story becomes really prime is the reason why people are still doing passion plays you know, it's like they're still putting them on with their kids or you know as part of a ceremony yeah well christ used parables right zen uses mm. codes there's a way mm. in which story can encode and can and it can invite us to recognize that reality is not so easy to collapse right as as uh as as Ravaki talks about the the moreness and suchness of things um there was something you were talking about in for some reason, this reminds me of something you're talking about in your your post post Tiamat interview with um, Brain We Are, um, which mm. by the way I think I disagree with, but uh, <laughs> you disagree with the name of their channel. But in any event, <laughs> uh, you're talking about this idea of uh, things that are real that don't exist. I say God is real, but doesn't exist. Yes. Yeah. Has Has John gotten you to read um, Platonism and the Objects of Science yet? Uh, it's on my list. Yes. Well, the whole <laughs> lot of books on that list. is that all the real things exist in a fundamental sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I was talking to my buddy Dane about this yesterday. We were out training, right? We were somehow this came up and I was talking about, uh, that idea of do do we were well, actually we were talking about souls right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We we're talking about do people believe that the soul is in the brain right and and i was like well do i believe in a soul and i was like i don't know if i believe in a soul again it's like it's it's very much jordan peterson right um <laughs> what do you mean by soul <laughs> what do you mean by believe but there's a way in which if we conceptualize time as a fourth dimension of the spatial uh, right then what happens when someone dies is that they've moved into that we've moved past the point in their spatial temporal presence where we can access access them directly but mm, actually mm. that spatial temporal point in time we've we're no longer within that horizon but that but that didn't actually go away it's still there mm. right mm -hmm in the same way that when we can't see over a mountain it doesn't mean that the things on the other side aren't there and so mm -hmm. there's a way in which once a pattern of being like the self comes into being it is always right it remains um is that a soul i don't know and this got us into the question of basically like are patterns real right is friendship real i can't point you to it i can't pick it up i can't move it around can't look at it in a microscope, mm -hmm. but it seems pretty real. Yeah, that's what I mean by it doesn't exist, but it is real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the way that you're using the word existence there is very interesting. Um, I guess you yes. need to go, which is too bad because we're in a pretty deep part of this conversation. With no real, uh, uh, it's not a co necessarily a coherence point. Um, people are who are interested in your work. We didn't actually talk nearly as much about your work as as I kind of expected to. But um, folks, I think, will pick up that you, like me, are kind of approaching the world of physical practices 
from a deeply philosophical lens with a lot yeah. of open questions and careful, heartfelt inquiry into mm -hmm. what's happening there. And you, you said you mentioned that you coach. Is that mostly coaching with, uh, with performers, or is your coaching kind of more broadly yeah. applicable now? My coaching is uh, is broad and uh, generally applicable. Um, and I can go into this when we next uh, do a recording because I, I really do want to like have another conversation specifically to target exactly where we where we left off here. Right. I think there's some I, I get a sense that it's like pushing up against something that can open up, um, whether or not that. Uh, transcends itself into TMS is besides the thing. I'm not really that interested in sort of selling what I've got. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do, I do do a, a, what I call transformational coaching. Um, so people can uh, book an appointment with me. Uh, they can just write me an email as well at ethan at five to midnight.org. Um, the website is there five to midnight.org is there as well. Um, and I also I'm available on like Instagram and, and sort of like regular socials. Ethan. Yeah. Just see, or? see, yeah, see, even see. Um, do you have a TM at car scheduled coming up? Uh, yes, I have a, a TM at session coming up. Uh, this is tier one. Yeah. Um, so very, so the basic uh, level is going to be in Toronto in February. Um, we have uh, another one in Prague uh, in April, and then we're doing another one in Rotterdam in May. Uh, and then possible more dates coming for the rest of the year. So if you want to yeah, sign I'll up for that, people go sign up for TMAT because then Ethan can sign up for Return of the Source and uh, yeah. <laughs> it serves everybody. Um, yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, have a good one. Bye bye. Thank you, good sir. Bye bye.